Good afternoon. Um, my name is Wendy Vi. I'm a neurointensivist at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on stroke and acute COVID-19 infection and the usefulness of TCV. So I'm going to start with um, a myth and talk a little bit about COVID. I have no relevant financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose. So myth number one, coronavirus comes from beer. Nope, that's, that's not true. In fact, coronaviruses are part of the family of coronaviridae that contain four distinct genera. The full sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was published in January of 2020 and revealed that it was a beta coronavirus, similar to other human coronaviruses that are responsible for about 15% of all cases of acute viral nasopharyngitis, otherwise known as the common cold. Myth number two, Donald Trump named it coronavirus. Nope, that is also fake news. In fact, coronaviruses, which have a diameter of about 100 nanometers, are named after their crown-like appearance on electron microscopy. And the coronavirus is a positive strand, single-stranded RNA uh, that is the largest genome of all of the RNA viruses, um, about 30 kilobases in length. It is encased in a nucleocapsid, uh, a lipid bilayer, which soap works, of course, to disrupt. And the spike protein of the virus binds to its cellular receptor, which is the androtensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 receptor. Then viral entry occurs um, after proteolytic cleavage of the spike protein by a transmembrane protease. And ACE2 is expressed abundantly in the lung alveolar cells, but also in many cell types and organs in the body, including, of course, the cerebral cortex. So why? Um, the the SARS-CoV-2 infection leads to neurological symptoms and whether and how the virus gains access to the central nervous system are not fully understood. There are two main competing hypotheses which are based on neurotropism and direct invasion of the coronavirus into the CNS and the indirect mechanisms which are mediated by the cytokine storm induced by systemic infection. Other mechanisms include para-infectious immune mediated neurological complications of severe systemic disease exacerbation of baseline neurologic disorders, and of course, treatment-associated neurologic complications. So is it a myth or fact that coronavirus causes large vessel occlusion in the young? Well, this is an article that came out fairly early in the pandemic um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and over a two-week period from March 23rd to April 7, 2020, at the Mount Sinai Hospital, a total of five patients who were younger than 50 years presented with new onset symptoms of large vessel ischemic stroke. And all five of these patients tested positive for COVID-19. And by comparison, every two weeks over the previous 12 months, the service had treated many fewer, on average less than one patient younger than 50 with a large vessel stroke. So these five patients had an elevated PT, PTT, fibrinogen, D-dimer, and ferritin consistent with a hypercoagulable state and presence of the disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. So the COVID-19 cerebrovascular disease does seem to be predominantly ischemic and to involve large vessels. In older people, it does tend to reflect the underlying severity of the systemic disease and the hyperinflammatory state, whereas in younger patients, it seems to be due to a hypercoagulopathy. This is a systematic review, which included data from 37 articles, 12 retrospective, two prospective, and other case reports in series. And the most commonly reported neurologic manifestations of COVID were myalgia, headache, altered sensorium, hyposmia, and hypogusia, altered taste and smell. Uncommonly, the COVID-19 virus was found to present with central nervous system manifestations like ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, encephalomyelitis, and acute myelitis, and peripheral nervous system manifestations like Guillain-Barre syndrome and Bell's palsy, and sometimes skeletal muscle symptoms like rhabdomyolysis. So the art, these uh, authors concluded that while COVID-19 typically presents as a self-limiting respiratory disease, it has been reported in about 20% to progress to severe illness with multi-organ involvement, and the neurologic man manifestations are not uncommon, although most are found to resolve with treatment of the underlying infection. This is another early study uh, from Wuhan, China of 214 patients where they um, uh, divided these patients into those with non-severe infection, about 59%, and severe infection, about 41%, according to respiratory status. And compared to the patients with non-severe infection, those with severe infection were older, they had more underlying disorders, especially hypertension, they 
uh, had fewer symptoms of typical COVID like fever and cough. And overall, 36% had neurologic manifestations, which were divided into three categories, central nervous system, such as dizziness, headache, impaired consciousness, acute cerebrovascular disease, ataxia and seizure, peripheral nervous system manifestations like taste, smell, and vision impairment, um, uh, as well as nerve pain, and then skeletal muscle manifestations. Um, and those with the severe disease seem to have a much higher incidence of these neurologic complications, 31% compared to those in the non-severe group at 21%. Those in the severe group also had, were more likely to have acute cerebrovascular diseases like stroke at 5.7% compared to 0.8%. So their conclusion of course was that patients with COVID-19 commonly have neurologic manifestations. Um, in other cohorts, ischemic stroke has been much less common. So in a Spanish cohort, ischemic stroke was only found in 1.3%. And in a French cohort, they performed 13 uh, MRIs on patients who had non-focal findings, but they did have encephalopathy. And they found only two patients had acute or subacute strokes, whereas 11 had bilateral frontotemporal hypoperfusion and eight had leptomeningeal enhancement. The CSF was negative. The PCR test for COVID was negative in all of those cases. Um, this is um, another study from uh, local, uh, local stroke centers in, in, in the state of Maryland. It is a retrospective analysis of quality improvement data reported by the stroke centers in Maryland. And these investigators looked at the number of admissions for stroke overall and by stroke subtype between March and September of 2020 during the peak of the pandemic and compared these with the same time period in 2019, so a year earlier. And they looked at the median last known well time to hospital arrival time, the number of intravenous thrombolysis cases and thrombectomy cases as well. And what they found was a significant decrease in intravenous thrombolysis treatment, um, from, um, which was a mean of 88 per month compared to a pre-pandemic mean of 115 cases per month, but no significant decrease for thrombectomies. The pandemic also decreased the probability of admissions for stroke and transient ischemic attack by 19% for acute ischemic stroke by 20% uh, for the number of intravenous thrombolysis cases by 23%. There was no difference, however, in the number of admissions for subarachnoid hemorrhage, which was a mean of 28 per month compared to a prior um, a mean of 31 per month. So let's turn to TCD now and how this might help us with the evaluation of stroke in COVID. So circulating microemboli within the cerebral arteries can of course be detected in real time using TCD ultrasound waves that are backscattered from the surface of emboli and manifest as these high intensity transient signals or hits within the Doppler spectrum. These are very brief, uh, they're unidirectional and they produce a characteristic chirping sound as they pass through the sample volume. So we were interested to study whether patients in who had COVID, who, who did not have known strokes, had microembolic signals on TCD exam. And for a brief period of time, um, we had uh, converted our neurocritical care units uh, to COVID units during April and May of 2020. And we studied 16 patients with confirmed COVID in this prospective TCD study uh, from the two, the two units. The TCD exams were performed as standard of care for the indications of encephalopathy and suspicion of cerebral emboli. And the MCAs of the brain were monitored through the temporal acoustic window with the patient supine resting quietly. Um, this was using manual monitoring and two megahertz probes with eight millimeter sample volumes. And we performed monitoring for only 15 minutes, um, which is of course inadequate for, um, for typical microembolic signal monitoring. But at this time, there was great hesitancy to go into these um, you know, rooms and into the COVID units. Um, it was very, very, uh, th th there was a lot of, of um, fear and anxiety. And I, one of our techs was, was willing to do this. And so it was an abbreviated exam, but uh, we did manage to get uh, TCDs on all these patients. We performed some other tests, which were transthoracic echocardiography for ejection fraction and markers of diastolic function and global longitudinal strain. We also calculated the arterial oxygen content from the values of hemoglobin and the fractional oxygen saturation at the time of the TCD uh, using the equation that you see here. And this is the table that shows the, um, the four groups of patients 
There were 26 patients in all included. 16 had confirmed COVID-19 infection. Two of these had acute ischemic stroke, secondary to large vessel occlusion. And then there were 10 non-COVID stroke patients who were included for comparison. Two of the COVID negative patients had severe ARDS and stroke due to large vessel occlusion. And the other COVID negative patients with acute ischemic stroke did not have ARDS or any uh, respiratory compromise. The median age of the COVID patients was about 64 years and about 59 years for the non-COVID patients with strokes. So um, in this table, almost all of the COVID patients were on mechanical ventilation and ARDS was moderate or severe in over half of them, as well as in the two COVID negative stroke patients with ARDS. On the echocardiogram, um, the objection fraction was a median of 60%, and there were no differences in EF between the COVID-19 negative patients with the COVID-19 positive patients, nor between the COVID positive versus negative stroke patients. This table shows laboratory values on admission. In the COVID-19 positive patients, the CRP, D-dimer, and fibrinogen were all elevated, as they also were in the COVID negative patients who presented with stroke. And here we see that TCD was performed at a median of four days uh, with a range of two to five days after admission. And at the time of TCD, all of the patients were afebrile. The hematocrit was below normal in all but four patients. And in the COVID positive patients, again, the CRP, D-dimer, and fibrinogen were all elevated. This graph shows the mean blood flow velocities in three of the groups. On the left are the median blood flow velocities in the COVID positive patients. And these were at the lower limit of normal relative to age adjusted normative values and lower relative to the other groups, both the COVID negative stroke patients with severe ARDS, which are in the middle, and the COVID negative stroke patients without severe uh, pulmonary manifestations on the far right. Um, in this figure, we see the TCD waveforms from a 53-year-old male with hypertension and diabetes who presented with a left MCA syndrome and was COVID positive. The TCD is done on day two. And the image shows low blood flow velocities and the morphology of the wave is monophasic or biphasic. We're really unable to see any peak systolic points here. And, and we see the mean velocities at the left top corner, which are calculated by uh, the TCD machine. You can see they're fairly low um, at um, 43 and uh, 28. Um, centimeters per second. Um, and we should note that, you know, in normal, in normal PCD, the waveforms are always triphasic with a long peak systolic phase. And this is a normal TCD spectrum. Um, and you can see the rapid systolic acceleration and stepwise deceleration during diastole and significant end diastolic velocity. Here's the MCA and the ICA on the left with similarly low blood flow velocities. And Yes, here, um, here is the basilar artery also with relatively uh, low velocity. And then if we compare to another patient, this is a COVID negative stroke patient with severe ARDS, a 55 year old male admitted with a left ICA occlusion. And this is the TCD on day three. And the peak systolic phase is longer and the velocities are significantly higher despite having severe ARDS. And uh, this patient actually died on, on day six. And here are the um, ACA waveforms, and here are the basilar artery waveforms. So we found that the mean blood flow velocities in the MCA were significantly correlated with the arterial oxygen content um, and with the CRP. And we found weak inverse correlations with the BUN to creatinine ratio, but not with the other variables tested, including the hematocrit, which was not significantly correlated despite being um, very low. We also um, found no correlations that were significant with the ejection fraction um, and the MCA velocities. So we consider the association between the low arterial oxygen content and the low blood flow velocities as a contradictory finding, since a negative correlation would have been expected secondary to hypoxic cerebral vasodilatation. In studies of plasma viscosity manipulation in humans, the arterial oxygen content has been found to be more important than the viscosity in determining the cerebral blood flow. And this, of course, reflects the importance of oxygen delivery to the brain and local mechanisms in cerebral blood flow autoregulation, whereas the viscosity seems to be an important determinant of blood flow when the autoregulation is defective. 
In the latter case, such as in ischemic tissue, the resistance vessels are maximally dilated due to deficient oxygen delivery. Um, and um, the hematocrit may increase significantly in the local area of the ischemic tissue, increasing the blood viscosity in that area and slowing the blood flow. This study, of course, did not evaluate autoregulation, but the positive associations between the relatively low blood flow velocities and the low arterial oxygen content might suggest autoregulatory impairment in this cohort of patients who are all relatively hypoxic. We did not detect any microembolic signals, um, although our period of observation was not adequate to definitively answer this question. So abnormal hemostasis is, of course, a well-recognized complication of COVID-19, including elevated D-dimers and markedly elevated fibrinogen levels. And the hemostasis abnormality in the lungs appears to result from a localized thrombosis rather than a DIC or a sepsis-induced coagulopathy. So if we propose that a similar microthrombotic pathology occurs in the cerebral blood vessels, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see embolic signals on the TCD, which are typically associated with cardiac emboli or emboli from more, more distant sources, proximal sources. And similarly, we did not find any TCD signs of vasculitis, which is also consistent with the autopsy findings. So this is from an autopsy study um, with about 20 patients. And these are images from patients who did not have any previous neurologic deficits. And it shows these perivascular inflammatory infiltrates, which were composed mostly of CD8 positive T cells and CD68 positive macrophages. And the presence of these T lymphocytes and macrophages occur, uh, associated with this perivascular inflammation seems to support the idea that microvascular injury may play a role in COVID-19 neurologic manifestations. Now, this is not to say that microemboli have not been detected in COVID patients. And this is an interesting study um, which performed contrast-enhanced TCD in 18 mechanically ventilated patients with severe COVID-19 pneumonia using agitated saline injected through a peripheral intravenous line in the arm or a central line in the internal jugular vein. And the first major finding from this study was that 83% of the patients had detectable microbubbles. And this prevalence is much higher than that reported in prior studies of patients with ARDS, and also much higher than would be expected from the natural occurrence of a of patent foramenal valley. In panels A and B, we see continuous spectral waveforms of the middle cerebral artery uh, during insonation over about five seconds. And panel C and D show the power M mode, and the positive microbubbles appear as vertical lines. The uh, contrast enhanced TCD detected a median of eight microbubbles with a range of zero to 300. The second finding was that the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio was inversely correlated with the number of microbubbles. So as the ratio goes down, you see the number of microbubbles goes up. And thirdly, the number of microbubbles was inversely correlated to the lung compliance. So these data suggested um, that pulmonary vascular dilatation may be a significant cause of hypoxemia in some patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. And somewhat surprisingly, it actually tracked with poor lung compliance. So the authors hypothesized that the detection of these transpulmonary bubbles might be analogous to hepatopulmonary syndrome seen in chronic liver disease, which is characterized by pulmonary vascular dilatations with increased blood flow to the affected lung units, and that results in a ventilation perfusion mismatch and hypoxemia. So the normal lung filters out these microbubbles from the agitated saline because the bubble diameter is larger than the normal pulmonary capillary. But in hepatopulmonary syndrome, and similar to what was observed in this study, it was hypothesized that the presence and the degree of these bubbles correlated with the degree of hypoxemia. This study seemed to raise the point that um, there, there may be um, a novel therapeutic target here in looking at management of hypoxemia associated with COVID-19. And finally, Bakker et al. reported on six consecutive patients with confirmed COVID-19 who underwent TCD evaluation for cerebral microemboli in the setting of suspected or confirmed acute ischemic stroke. And again, they did bilateral incination of the middle cerebral arteries using a two megahertz probe for a period of 45 to 60 minutes. So a very an adequate um, uh, duration of monitoring. Um, they used an eight millimeter sample volume and nine uh, decibel detection threshold. And a total of eight TCD studies were performed in six patients with COVID-19 um, at a median age of 65 years, 
four of these had confirmed ischemic strokes and two had refractory encephalopathy. And they found microemboli in three male patients, um, two patients who had a stroke and one who had prolonged encephalopathy. And these were of varying intensity and identified in multiple vascular territories in two of the patients. And they persisted despite therapeutic anticoagulation in a third patient. And of the three patients without evidence of microemboli on TCD, two of these had stroke and one had refractory encephalopathy. So the identification of the microemboli in three of the six patients studied over a two-week period suggested to these authors that microemboli may not be uncommon in patients with COVID-19 who develop neurologic symptoms. However, this study did consist of patients in whom neurologic consultation was obtained and the consulting neurologist requested a TCD emboli detection study. So there's a possibility of selection bias, of course. The authors did um, evaluate the potential relationship between the circulating microemboli and the systemic inflammatory and coagulation markers, the CRP, ferritin, and D-dimer, which are all routinely uh, monitored in COVID-19 patients. And while each of these markers was elevated in most of the patients at the time of the TCD study, there was a lot of overlap in the range of these markers seen in patients both with and without microemboli detected. So they concluded that further research would be required to determine if there are inflammatory and coagulation markers that are useful in predicting those patients at the highest risk for circulating microemboli and potentially neurologic sequelae. So while CCD can detect circulating cerebral microemboli, the technique is not able, of course, to determine the mechanism by which the emboli have formed. And there are numerous potential mechanisms for emboli formation that have been described in COVID-19. Um, autopsy series have suggested evidence of hypercoagulability, as well as endotheliitis and endothelial dysfunction. And acute cardiac injury, heart failure, and arrhythmias have all been observed in, in COVID patients. So in conclusion, um, we have three potential roles identified for TCD in COVID-19 infection. The first um, is uh, our study, which found low blood flow velocities in COVID-19 with severe ARDS and critical illness and identifies potentially impaired cerebral autoregulation where arterial oxygen content is correlated with cerebral blood flow velocities. In the second study, um, there was the association of microbubbles with severe hypoxemia, and this identified intrapulmonary vasodilatation, which could represent a novel therapeutic target in the management of hypoxemia associated with COVID-19. And finally, in the third study, circulating cerebral microemboli may occur in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 who do experience stroke or have unexplained refractory encephalopathy. And these met microemboli can occur in the absence of severe pulmonary manifestations. So for future studies, um, I would certainly recommend if we are gonna do TCD in COVID patients, that bilateral TCD studies supplemented by at least 60 minutes of emboli detection be performed with a TCD bubble study. Thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.